Part One. Barwyke Hall. About thirty years ago, I was sent by two old sisters to visit a property in Lancashire near the Forest of Pendle. They wanted to divide the small property that included a house and some land. They had inherited it a long time before. My journey to Lancashire began in September. A beautiful season in that part of England. At half past five, I stopped at the Three Duck Inn and had some dinner while my horses were changed. The owner was a friendly old man of sixty-five who enjoyed talking to his guests. I wanted to learn more about Barwyke, the property I was going to see, but the owner did not have much to tell me. Old Squire Bowes died more than twenty years ago. And no one lived there now except for the gardener and his wife. Tom Windsor is probably as old as me, but he's a bit taller and thinner," said the fat owner. "Well, I've heard that there are stories about the house that keep people far away," I said, looking at him. "Oh, stories from many years ago," said the owner. "I don't remember them after all these years." People would always talk about old, empty houses. I tried getting more information from him, but for some reason, the old owner did not want to tell me the stories about Barwyke. I am sure he remembered them. I paid my bill and continued my journey, but I was a bit disappointed. After an enjoyable journey through the beautiful woods, I arrived at Barwyke Hall. It was a large, steep-roofed Elizabethan house, which stood in the middle of a park with several tall trees. The wall of the park was grey and covered with ivy. Close to the park, I could see a lake that looked cold and black. I remembered that the lake was connected with a strange story I heard when I was a boy. I drove up the road under the red and yellow autumn leaves of the tall trees. As I walked to the front door of the house, I could see it was large and gloomy. No one looks after this house, I thought, as I looked at the old broken shutters and the dirty wall. Tall grass and strange plants were growing everywhere in the garden. It was quite a sad place. I walked up the steps, looked around, and saw the dark lake that added sadness to the scene. Near the centre of the lake. There was a small island with two old trees. Fortunately, there's the light of the sunset to make things more cheerful. I thought as I knocked on the front door. A friendly old man with a red nose opened the door and welcomed me. I followed him through a dark hall into a large room with old-fashioned furniture. There were curtains on the two windows and a piece of Turkish carpet on the floor. From the windows, I had a view of the lake. My bedroom was at the far end of the room, and its window looked out onto the lake too. Although these rooms were dark and gloomy, they were very clean. There was nothing to complain about. I gave instructions for dinner, and then asked old Tom Windsor, who looked after the property, to show me around, since there was still some sunlight on that lovely autumn evening. Tom was a strong old man who walked very quickly. We walked through the trees to the northern part of the property. And saw an old church. The door of the church was open, and we entered. The sexton, a polite little hunchback, was happy to show us the church and its monuments. One in particular interested me. It was a monument to Squire Bowes of Barwyke Hall. The writing on the monument said great things about him, and informed that he died at the age of seventy-one. Part two, Old Squire Bowes. I stood in the cemetery of the church and said, "The squire died twenty years ago." Yes, sir, twenty years ago on the ninth of last month," said Tom Windsor. "Was he a good old gentleman?" I asked. "Yes, he was," said Tom. "But it isn't easy to say what's in them, or what they may become, and some of them go mad." I did not understand what he was trying to say. You don't think he was mad, do you? 
I asked. Oh no, not him, sir," said Tom. He was a bit lazy, but he knew what he was doing. Tom's comments were mysterious, but like old Squire Bowes, I was a bit lazy that evening, and I did not ask any more questions. It was getting dark when we started going back to Barwick Horn. As we walked down the narrow road among the old trees, something ran quickly towards us and made a strange sound, like a frightened laugh or cry. I was quite surprised and frightened, because it was a human figure dressed in white. At first, I thought it was a white horse running down the road. Tom Windsor turned around and looked at the strange figure. He's travelling tonight," said Tom in a low voice. "It's not difficult to find a bed for him, some leaves or some soft grass. That boy last slept in a house twenty years ago." "What do you mean?" I asked. "Is he mad?" "Something like that, sir," said Tom. "We call him Dickon the Devil because devil is the only word he says." The only word! I exclaimed. Yes, the only word," said Tom. For some reason, I felt that Dick and the Devil was in some way connected to the story of Old Squire Bowes. People probably say strange things about him," I said. More or less, sir. More or less," said Tom. Some stories are very strange. He last slept in a house twenty years ago. I asked. That's when the squire died. Yes, sir. Not long after. You have to tell me about him tonight after supper, Tom. I said. Tom did not seem to like my invitation. He looked straight ahead as we walked on and said in a low voice, "You see, sir, now the house is quiet and nothing troubles the people of Barwick." And my wife doesn't want to talk about these things. I understand," I said quietly. It was getting dark, and we walked home without saying a word. It was not a cold night, but I was glad to see some wood burning in the fireplace. It made the room more cheerful. A small table with a white tablecloth was ready for supper. After supper, I was too sleepy to listen to Tom's story. So I went to my bedroom and fell asleep by ten o'clock. That night, I had a frightening experience. By the next night, I finished my work at Barwick. I worked hard from early morning, and I had no time to think about the frightening experience of the night before. At the end of the day, I was sitting at the little supper table after a good meal. It was a warm evening, and I opened the window and looked out into the dark. Tom, I said, "Tell me who, other than your wife and you and myself, slept in the house last night." Tom put down his glass and looked at me nervously without saying a word. "Who else slept in the house?" he repeated slowly. "Yes, Tom. Who else?" I asked firmly. "Not a living thing, sir." And he looked at me again. That's very strange," I said, looking at him in the eyes. "Are you sure you were not in my room last night?" "No, sir. Not until I came to call you this morning," he said. "Well," I said, "there was someone there. I'm sure. I was very tired and I could not get up, but a noise woke me up. It was the noise of someone throwing my two tin boxes on the floor. You know." The tin box is where I keep my papers. I heard a step on the floor, and there was light in the room. However, before going to sleep, I put out the candle. Whoever it was, he went out of the room, and the light went with him. I wanted to sleep again, but I saw a light on the opposite wall. I sat up on the bed and saw the door opening. A hand was holding the edge of the door and was pushing it open. But it was a very strange hand. Let me see yours. He showed me his hand, and I examined it. Oh no, there's nothing wrong with your hand, I said. That hand had another shape, and it was fatter. 
The middle finger was shorter than the rest, and it looked like it was broken. The nail looked like a claw. I called out, "Who's there?" And suddenly the light in the hand disappeared. That was him! Exclaimed Tom Windsor, as his red nose became pale and his eyes almost flew out of his head. Who? I asked. Old Squire Bowes. That was his hand you saw. Oh, God help us! Answered Tom. What are you saying? I cried. The broken finger and the nail. It was old Squire Bowes. You came here for the two Dymock sisters' business. The squire didn't want them to inherit Barwyke after his death. He wanted to leave Barwyke to someone else. He was always polite to everyone, but he didn't like those two ladies. When I heard you were here for the Dymock sisters' business, I was worried. And now you can see why he's back again, and he'll start his old tricks again. I was completely confused. His old tricks? I asked. Yes, sir. His old tricks, said Tom nervously. Listening activity. It was a dark night. I walked slowly down the hallway in the old house towards the door. Suddenly, I heard a noise. It sounded like footsteps. I felt afraid. I began to run. Then I fell down, and it was too late. Part three. Dickon. I wanted to know what was happening, so I asked Tom Windsor to explain. As you know. Squire Bowes of Barwyke died without making a will," said Tom. "And everyone was sorry when he died, because the people of Barwyke liked him. He was never unfriendly or angry. He could not hurt a fly. When the ladies inherited the property, they immediately bought some cows for the park. They didn't know that this was not wise. Soon. Something was wrong with the cows, and the animals slowly died. Then people began telling strange stories. They said that Squire Bowes walked among the trees in the evening, and when he saw the cows, he stopped and put his hand on the back of one of them, and that one became sick the next day and died. The people saw his ghost. I said, surprised. Yes. It was his ghost, but no one ever met him in the park or in the woods. They recognized him at a distance, and they could see the animal he put his hand on, white, grey, or black, and that animal got sick the next day and died. People were afraid of taking the path near the park, and no one wanted to walk in the woods of Barwyke. At that time, there was a man called Tom Pike. He was the old squire's groom and the only person who slept in the house. Tom was angry when he heard these stories, which he did not believe. He could not find a man or boy to look after the cows because everyone in Barwyke was afraid. So he wrote to his brother Richard, called Dick or Dickon, a clever young man who lived in Derbyshire. When Dickon came, the cows were better. People said they could still see the old squire walking with his stick in his hand, but he didn't go near the cows because Dickon was there. The old squire looked at the cows for about an hour, and then disappeared like smoke. One night in November, Tom Pike and his brother Dickon were in bed in the servants' room. They were alone in the house, and all the doors were locked. Tom was lying next to the wall, and he was awake. His brother Dickon was sleeping next to him. Suddenly, Tom's eyes turned toward the door. It opened slowly, and Old Squire Bowes came in. He looked like a horrible ghost. Tom was terrified. He couldn't breathe, and he couldn't take his eyes off him. The old squire came to the side of the bed, put his arms. Under Dickon, who was sleeping, and carried him out of the room. Right after this happened, the light suddenly went out, and Tom couldn't see anything. 
He lay in bed, more dead than alive, until the next morning. How terrible! I said. Tom's brother Dickon was gone. He looked for him everywhere in the house. He even asked a few neighbours to help him search in the woods, but no one could find Dickon. At last, one of the neighbours thought of the island in the lake. He and Tom took a little boat and went to the island. They found Dickon sitting under a big tree, and he was mad, completely mad. They asked him several questions, but he cried out only one answer: "Bows the devil! See him! See him! Bows the devil!" Dickon became mad, and he never slept under a roof any more. Now he goes from house to house during the day. But people don't want to meet him at night, because they're afraid. A long silence followed Tom's story. He and I were alone in that large room, and I looked out of the window at the dark night. I thought I saw something white moving near the trees. Then I heard a low sound that became a loud cry. Ooh. Bows the devil, over your shoulder! Whoa! Ha 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 ha! I jumped up and saw by the light of a candle Dickens' wild eyes and frightening face. He was looking at his long fingers, and talking to himself. Tom Windsor quickly closed the window. The story was over. I was glad when I heard the sound of the carriage and the horses outside. A few minutes later, I said goodbye to Tom, and I happily left the haunted house of Barwyke behind me. Listening activity. Imagine you are going to tell a ghost story to a group of people. First, you need to find the right place and time to tell your story. A dark room in an old house would be perfect. Especially if you tell your listeners that the house is haunted, be sure that you tell your story late at night. Turn off the lights and put candles around the room. If you want your listeners to be really scared, play a CD of scary sound effects like screams and footsteps. Speak very softly and quietly at first, so that everyone must move closer to hear you. Then make your voice louder and louder near the end of the story. For an unforgettable ending, ask a friend to grab someone suddenly at the end of the story. This will make that person scream, and maybe everyone else will scream as well. But remember, never tell a really frightening ghost story to anyone younger than ten years old, even if it's your younger brother or sister. The Return of Imre. Part One. Imre disappears. Imre lived and worked in a little town in northern India. He was happy and well, and had a lot of friends. Then one day he was not at his office or his home, and no one could find him. He suddenly disappeared. His friends could not understand where he went or why. They were worried and started looking in the rivers and lakes near the town and along the roads. They contacted the railways and the nearest seaport, but no one could find him. As the weeks passed, his friends slowly stopped talking about him. They decided to sell his guns, horses, and other things. His boss at work wrote a letter to Imre's mother in England and told her that her son disappeared. When the hot season was over, my friend Strickland, a policeman, decided to rent Imray's house. Strickland was a rather strange man and did not say much, but I often visited him. There was always plenty of food in his house, but there were no regular times for meals. He ate walking around. He liked his guns and fishing rods, and he loved his big dog, Tichens. She was a huge animal who ate as much as two men. The natives respected her. She never left her master's side. This amazing dog 
saved Strickland's life one night when a local criminal wanted to kill him in his sleep. Ditchens caught the man who was later hanged. From that day on, the dog wore a silver collar and slept with a fine blanket. A short time later, Strickland went to live in Imray's house, and he gave Titchens a big room for herself where she could eat and sleep. One day, I arrived in town late in the afternoon, and since there were no rooms at the hotel, I went to visit him. Titchens met me at the door of the house and put her paws on my shoulder to show that she was glad to see me. She did not move away until Strickland came home and greeted me. He was glad to give me a room for a few days. The house had eight rooms, a veranda, a big garden, and everything was nice and clean. After a small, fast lunch, Strickland said, "I'm going back to the police station for a few hours. I'll see you later." It was a very hot summer evening, and the rainy season was starting. I had tea on the veranda where it was a little cooler. Titchens came out on the veranda and sat next to me. She looked sad, so I gave her some biscuits. It was dark in the house, and it was raining hard. Suddenly, my servant came and said, "Excuse me, sir. A gentleman is here and wants to see someone." I went to the dark living room and asked the servant to bring some light. As I waited, I thought I saw a face looking at me through the window, but when the light came, I did not see anyone. Where was the gentleman who wanted to see someone? I went back to the veranda, but Tijens was out in the garden under the pouring rain. Strickland came home very wet, and the first thing he said was, "Has anyone called?" I told him about the visitor who disappeared. But he did not say a thing. At nine o'clock, Strickland wanted to go to bed, and I was tired too. Tijens was outside in the rain, and Strickland called her several times, but she did not want to come into the house. Strickland smiled strangely and said, "She does this every evening now. She doesn't want to sleep in the house. She started doing this after we came to live here." And I can't understand why. She's got a big, comfortable room. He wasn't happy, but said, "Well, let's leave her outside." The storm and thunder and lightning went on all night, but Tijens stayed outside. She was near the window of my room, and I could hear her moving around during the night. I looked out of the window once and saw the big dog with the hair on her neck and back standing up. She was very frightened. I did not sleep well, and had strange dreams. It seemed that someone was calling my name. Then someone tried to open my door, walked around the house, and stood on the veranda, breathing loudly. Suddenly there was a noise, and I ran into Strickland's room and asked, "Are you ill, or did you try to call me?" He was lying on his back, and I explained what happened to me. He started laughing and said, <laughs> "Oh, go back to bed." I went back to bed, and slept until the next morning. I lived in that house for two days. Strickland went to work at the police station every day and left me alone with Titchens. The dog was happy inside the house during the day, but when the sun set and it became dark, she went to the veranda, where we sat together. I understood Titchens very well because I was happy in the house during the day too, but when it was dark, I felt very uncomfortable and did not like it. We were alone in the house, but there was another presence that I could not see. I saw that the long curtains between the rooms moved, and I could hear the noise of feet on the floor. I could hear chairs move, and doors open and close. When I went to get a book in the living room, I felt that someone was watching me from the darkest corner of the room. 
Stitchens stared into the dark rooms with every hair on her neck and her back standing up. She did not enter the rooms, but her eyes moved around. She could see someone or something that I could not see. Part two. Imre returns. On the third evening during dinner, I decided to talk to Strickland about the house and its strange presence. I'm going to the hotel tomorrow because they've got a free room now. I can't stay here any longer. I hear noises in this house, and I can't sleep at night. I'm very tired. Strickland. Listened carefully and understood. Stay with me for a few more days, he said, and see what happens. I know there's something very strange about this house. I think Titchens knows, and that's why she stays outside after dark. Don't leave now. Suddenly, he stopped talking and looked at one corner of the ceiling above my chair. Look at that. The tails of two brown snakes were hanging between a thick cloth and the ceiling. I hate snakes and am afraid of them. Let's get them down and break their backs, I said. Snakes like to hide between the ceiling cloth and the ceiling, said Strickland. I'm going up into the roof of this house. I'll shake them down, and you can break their backs with a long stick. I was not very happy to help Strickland with his work, but I took a long stick while he went to get the gardener's ladder from the veranda. We could hear the snakes moving along the ceiling cloth above our heads. Snakes like it up there because it's warm," said Strickland, breaking the thick ceiling cloth with his hands. He put his head through the opening of the ceiling cloth and looked around. Hmm. He said, "There's a lot of room up here between the ceiling and the roof. I can't see any snakes, but what's this? I think I see something up here." He started pushing at something with his gun. "I can't get it, but be careful. It's falling down." I jumped away, and suddenly something fell onto the dinner table. Strickland got off the ladder and stood next to me. I think our friend Imre has come back," said Strickland slowly. Something moved from under the cloth on the table. It was a brown snake. Strickland hit it with his gun and broke its back. "Is it Imre?" I asked. "Yes, it's Imre," he answered. "And someone killed him." That's why we heard noises in the house," I said. "It was Imre's ghost walking around." And that's why Titchens didn't like sleeping inside the house," said Strickland. "She knew Imre was up there, dead." A minute later, Titchens came into the house. She looked at the dead body on the table, and then sat down next to Strickland. You knew about Imre all the time, didn't you? Strickland said to his dog. Men don't climb up into the roof to die. Someone killed Imre, but who? Let's think about it. Let's think about it in the other room. I said, not in here. Excellent idea, said Strickland. Let's go to my room. We sat down and started thinking. Imre is back," said Strickland. "The question is, who killed Imre? When I took this house, I took Imre's servants too. Did one of them kill him? Let's call them in one at a time and question them," I said. There was a noise outside Strickland's room. It was Bahadur Khan, one of the servants. "Come in," said Strickland. It's a very warm night, isn't it? Bahadur Khan was a big, tall man with a green turban. Yes, sir, he said. But it will rain soon. 
When did you start working for me, Bahadur Khan? Strickland asked. I started when you came to live here, sir, said the servant. You know, after Mr. Imre secretly went to Europe. Imre went to Europe? Strickland asked. That is what all the servants say, sir, said Bahadur Khan. Will you be his servant when he returns? Strickland asked him. Yes, of course, said the servant. This is very strange, said Strickland. I asked the other servants, but they didn't know. Mr. Imray never said anything about a trip to Europe to anyone. Don't you think that's strange? It is strange, sir, said the servant, who was frightened now. You know, Bahadur, said Strickland, I think Imre is back again. He's back in this house, and he's waiting for his old servant. Take a lamp and go to the next room. The man was frightened now. He picked up the lamp and went into the dining room. Strickland picked up his gun from the floor and followed him. The tall servant went to the next room and looked at the ceiling. Then... He saw the dying snake on the floor and stopped near the table to look at the dead man. The servant's face was grey with fear. Do you see? asked Strickland coldly. Mr. Imre is back. I see, sir, said the servant. I know you killed him, Bahadur Khan, said Strickland. Now tell me why. Yes, I killed him, sir, said Bahadur Khan, but he was not a good man. One day he saw my child who was four years old. He said he was a handsome child, and he put his hand on his head. The next day my child was ill, very ill. He had a fever and died ten days later. Mr. Imre killed my son. He was a wizard, a bad man. I killed him when he was sleeping. Then I put his body between the ceiling cloth and the roof. Strickland looked at me and said, Did you hear that? He killed Imre. You were clever, Bahadur Khan, said Strickland. But Mr. Imre came back. And you'll be hanged for this. I'm taking you to the police station now. Bahadur Khan did not try to escape. He stared at the floor and suddenly lifted his foot. No, sir, said Bahadur Khan sadly. You're not taking me to the police station. Hanging is a terrible dishonor for me and my people. Look, sir. He lifted his foot and we saw the head of the little brown karite snake that Strickland hit before. Its teeth were in his foot, and Bahadur was dying. In an hour he was dead, and the police took him and Imre away. Strickland and I sat down and looked at each other. Did you hear what Bahadur said? asked Strickland calmly. Yes, I did, I answered quietly. Unfortunately... Imre made a big mistake. He didn't know about the superstitions of these people, Strickland said. No, he didn't, I said. Imre's ghost left the house, and Tichens came back and slept in her room. The Minister's Black Veil Part 1 The Veil the sexton stood outside the church in the Puritan town of Milford, in New England, ringing the bell. The old people of the village came walking slowly along the street. Children walked happily next to their parents in their Sunday clothes. Young men looked at the pretty girls who seemed prettier on Sundays than on weekdays. The sexton kept his eye on Reverend Hooper's door, and when the Reverend opened it, he stopped ringing the bell. What has Reverend Hooper got on his face? The sexton cried, amazed. 
Everyone turned around and looked at Reverend Hooper, who was walking slowly towards the church. Are you sure he's our Reverend? Asked John Gray. Of course it is," said the sexton. Reverend Hooper, a man of about thirty, was dressed in his best Sunday clothes, but there was one strange thing about him that morning. He had a black veil tied to his forehead. It covered his whole face, except for his mouth and chin. The people who stood at the door of the church looked at him, amazed. What's the Reverend wearing on his face? Asked Goodman Gray. I don't know, and I don't like it," said an old woman. Why is he hiding his face? Asked a young man. He looks awful. Is he our Reverend or not? Asked a boy. Our Reverend is mad," cried Goodman Gray, entering the church. As Reverend Hooper entered the church, the whole congregation looked at him, and several little boys climbed onto the seats to get a better view. But the Reverend did not seem to notice anything, and slowly walked to the pulpit and looked at his congregation. He never took the mysterious veil off, but it moved a bit when he breathed. Was he trying to hide from someone? God, perhaps. Or was he trying to hide something? A few women who were frightened by the black veil left the church. This Sunday's sermon was darker, gloomier, and more powerful than the others. The sermon was about secret sins and the mysteries which we hide from our family, and even from ourselves, forgetting that God can see them. Every member of the congregation felt that behind his awful veil, the Reverend could discover their secret sins. Hooper did not say anything violent or terrible, and yet the congregation shook with fear. Was this their Reverend, or was there a stranger behind the black veil? At the end of the sermon, the people hurried out of the church. Some started talking together quietly. And others talked loudly. A few shook their heads, saying that they could not understand the mystery. At last, Reverend Hooper came out of the church and greeted his congregation as he always did on Sundays. But no one walked by his side on that day. And for the first time, old Mister Saunders did not invite him to Sunday dinner. Therefore. The Reverend returned to his home with a sad smile behind his black veil. Something is very wrong with Reverend Hooper," said the doctor of the village. Although that black veil covers only our Reverend's face, he looks like a ghostly figure from head to foot. Oh, I agree," said his wife. "I can't look at him." Later that morning. The church bell rang for the funeral of a young woman. Her relatives and friends waited in her house for Reverend Hooper. He arrived, and was still wearing the black veil. He walked into the room where the coffin with the body of the young woman was, and stood next to it. Then he bent over the coffin, and his veil hung straight down from his forehead. An old woman who was sitting near the coffin. Said that the body of the young woman shook when the Reverend looked at her. The Reverend left the room and went into the living room, where friends and relatives were waiting for the funeral prayer. After the prayer, the funeral procession walked slowly down the street, and Reverend Hooper followed in his black veil. Why are you looking back? A man in the procession asked a woman. I thought I saw the Reverend and the young woman's ghost walking hand in hand," replied the woman. "So did I," said a young girl. That evening in Milford, there was a wedding ceremony. Although Reverend Hooper was a rather sad, gloomy man, he was always cheerful at weddings, and the people of his congregation liked this. When he arrived at the wedding ceremony. The first thing the congregation saw was the horrible black veil. 
Everyone was very disappointed. His black veil added more sadness to the funeral, said one woman. And now it will bring bad luck to this wedding ceremony. The young bride was pale and frightened. Her face is so pale that she looks like the young woman who was buried a few hours ago, said a man to his wife. What a gloomy wedding, said his wife. The poor young bride. After performing the ceremony, the reverend raised a glass of wine to his lips. I wish happiness to the new couple, he said. At that moment, he saw his figure in a mirror. He trembled. His lips became white and the glass of wine fell to the carpet. The horror of the black veil terrified him like it terrified all the others. He ran away into the darkness of the night. Listening Activity Dear Diary, It was a beautiful Sunday morning. The sun was shining brightly. Mrs. Hamilton was walking towards the church with her two little boys, carrying her baby in her arms. Both the little ones brought flowers for the church. A little girl was picking the little yellow flowers in front of the church, while her grandmother held the basket of flowers for her. Her mother stood close by with the baby. I noticed there were a couple of dogs by the edge of the crowd. One of them was running around and barking. I think they belonged to the three Saunders boys. The sexton arrived with the big church door key in his hand. I asked if he brought his prayer book today, and he said it was in the church where he left it last week. He unlocked the door, went inside, and started ringing the church bell. And then something terrible happened. Part 2 Elizabeth The next day the whole village of Milford talked about Reverend Hooper's black veil. What mystery was hidden behind it? No one knew, and everyone talked about it. Friends on the street, women at their open windows, children on their way to school, the owner of the inn with his customers. But strangely, none of the people of the congregation asked the reverend about the black veil. In the past, these people often talked to him about several matters, and he was always glad to listen to them. The black veil created a terrible feeling of fear, and no one wanted to talk to him about it. We must talk to Reverend Hooper about the black veil, said John Gray. He must give us an explanation. Yes, said the sexton. Let's choose a small group of people and go and talk to him. So a group of people from the congregation was chosen, and they went to discuss the veil with him. The reverend received the group politely, but he was silent during the meeting. No one knew how to start the discussion about the veil that caused so many rumours and so much fear. At times, they could see a small, sad smile on the reverend's lips. It seemed that there was a veil on his heart that hid a terrible secret. If he takes off that awful veil, we can talk to him, the people thought. But he never took it off, and so they sat in the reverend's house in silence. They could not speak because they were confused and nervous. They returned to their homes. But there was one person in the village who was not afraid of the black veil. She was the reverend's wife, Elizabeth, and she wanted an explanation. No, she said aloud, smiling. There is nothing terrible in this veil, except that it hides a face I like to look at. Please, take it off and tell me why you put it on. Reverend Hooper looked at his wife and smiled weakly. There will be a time in the future, he said, when all of us will take off our veils. Don't be angry if I wear it until then. Your words are mysterious, said the young woman. I don't understand them. 
Elizabeth, he said, this veil is a kind of symbol, and I must wear it forever, during the day and at night, and when I am alone or in front of people and friends. No living person will see me without it. This black veil must separate me from the world. Even you, Elizabeth, can never come behind it. Why must you live in the dark forever? asked Elizabeth, confused. Like most other people, I too have troubles that I must hide behind this veil, said the Reverend. But perhaps the world won't understand, said Elizabeth. You are respected and loved by your congregation. People might think you're hiding your face because of a secret sin. Think of your position. You're the Reverend of Milford, an honest, respected man. The Black Veil might cause a lot of rumours. She could see a sad smile from behind her husband's veil, but she could not convince him. Elizabeth sat silently for a few moments and thought, What else can I say to convince him? Perhaps he's going mad. Although Elizabeth was a strong woman, she started crying. <laughs> Do you feel the horror of the veil? He asked sadly. She did not reply, but covered her eyes with her hand and turned to leave the room. He caught her arm. Elizabeth, be patient with me, he cried. Don't leave me. Although this veil must come between us here on earth, it's only a veil for this life on earth. Oh, you don't know how lonely and frightened I am behind it. Don't leave me in this darkness forever. Lift the veil only once and look at me in the face, she said. No, never. I can't, replied the Reverend. Then goodbye, said Elizabeth. She slowly walked away from her husband and stopped at the door. As she looked at the black veil once more, she seemed to understand its mystery. In his sadness, the Reverend smiled, thinking that the veil separated him from happiness. Part 3 The Deathbed During the years, no one could understand why the Reverend wore the veil. A few people in town decided that perhaps the Reverend was mad. But for most of the people of Milford, the Reverend became a problem. He could not walk down the streets of Milford because some people turned away from him, and others annoyed him. He could not take his usual walk to the cemetery at sunset because there were people behind the tombstones who wanted to see his black veil. Reverend Hooper doesn't go to the cemetery anymore because the ghosts of the dead sent him away, said one woman. That doesn't surprise me, said another woman. Who knows what he's hiding behind that awful veil? It frightens me terribly. He was quite upset because the children of the town ran away when they saw him on the street. Their fear made him understand that some kind of ghostly horror was hidden in the black veil. He hated it, and never wanted to pass in front of a mirror and look at himself. The people of Milford started believing that the Reverend was greatly disturbed by some horrible crime. The poor man lived in a dark cloud of sin and sadness, so that love and friendship could never reach him. The wind respected his terrible secret, and never blew it aside. Ghosts and devils meet with Reverend Hooper behind that black veil, said an old woman. Yes, ghosts, devils and evil spirits too, said her husband. On the other hand, the black veil made Hooper a very efficient reverend. He became a man of power and a very important religious leader in his area. Many people on their deathbed wanted to see Reverend Hooper. But when he bent over to say some kind words to them, they shook with fear because their face was so close to the veil. Strangers travelled long distances to go to the Reverend's church and look at him. Governor Belcher 
once asked the Reverend to give the important election sermon. This was a great honor in the Puritan community, and he was very pleased. The election sermon told the people that only a good member of the church could govern them well. Reverend Hooper lived a long religious life. He was a kind, loving man, but no one loved him, and most people were afraid of him. As the years passed, he became known as Father Hooper in the New England churches. Father Hooper's time to rest came soon. Many people were present near the deathbed of the old reverend, but there were no relatives. There was a doctor who tried to make his last hours less painful, and other members of his church. There was also the Reverend Clark of Westbury, a bright young man who hurried to the deathbed of Father Hooper. And there was Elizabeth, whose calm love lasted through the years of loneliness. Father Hooper's head lay on the death pillow, with the black veil still covering his face and moving with each weak breath. It separated him from a woman's love and from friendship. It kept him in the worst of all prisons, his own heart. And now it still lay on his face and made the gloom of the deathbed even darker. For some time, the reverend's mind was confused. It moved between the past and the present. He was ill, and his body moved from one side of the bed to the other. But even during these moments, he did not want to lift the black veil from his face. Elizabeth was sitting next to the deathbed, and she too was careful not to lift it. The old reverend was very weak and could hardly breathe. The reverend of Westbury went to his side and said, Dear Father Hooper, the hour of death is close. You are a religious man. Please don't leave this world with the black veil on your face. Are you ready to lift it? The young reverend of Westbury gently bent forward to lift the veil. But suddenly, to everyone's surprise, Father Hooper put both of his hands on the black veil. Never! he cried. Never on this earth! Dark old man! cried the frightened young reverend. What horrible sin are you taking to the next life? Tell me! With his last breath, Father Hooper sat up in his bed, and everyone was surprised. Why are you afraid of me? he said, looking at the people around his bed. Aren't you afraid of each other? Has everyone avoided me all these years only for my black veil? Why is this veil so awful? Are you afraid of the mystery that it hides? I look around me, and I see a black veil on every face. Oh! exclaimed the young reverend. There was a gloomy silence in the room, and everyone stared at the deathbed and at Father Hooper. The people around him were frightened and moved away from one another. Father Hooper fell back upon his pillow with a weak smile on his lips. He was dead. He was put in his coffin and buried with the black veil, and his face is now dust.